The next uh, brief announcement, I hope I don't take too much time, is that during this last one week, not only did we have an announcement about elections in Trinidad and Tobago, but also we had a momentous decision taken by the government of Turkey and apparently supported by most Muslims in Turkey, but opposed by all Christians, uh, to take Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia, what is that? It is a cathedral. A cathedral is not just a, mus a, a, a church. It's the biggest one of all, a cathedral. The cathedral of Hagia Sophia, which was, which, which, which was built in Constantinople. And it was, uh, it was the most famous uh, uh, Christian building in the world, other than in Jerusalem, the most famous of all. For 1,000 years, that was Hagia Sophia, Christian Cathedral. And uh, when the Ottoman Empire, excuse me, conquered Constantinople in 1452, almost uh, 600 years ago, the Ottoman Sultan Muhammad Fateh, the first thing that he did was to convert this cathedral into a masjid. I don't know about other scholars of Islam in the world today, whether there are any others who uh, hold the same views that I hold. But it really doesn't matter to me if nobody, if, if, if mine must be a lonely voice, a voice crying in the wilderness, I'm accustomed to that. I have said that it is with the Qur'an that we must judge all things. And if you betray the Qur'an, they have a price to pay for that. And when I used the Qur'an, I came to the conclusion, number one, that the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople 600 years ago was in violation of Allah's command in the Qur'an. And uh, I wrote this book, Constantinople, in the Quran, and we try to put it in the background just now, yeah. Constantinople in the Quran. Um, here we are. Constantinople in the Quran. I wrote this book uh, last year, and uh, in this book I analyzed the conquest of Constantinople 600 years ago by the Ottoman Empire. And I also analyzed the conversion, transformation of the cathedral of Hagia Sophia into a masjid. And I used the Quran on both occasions to do it. And I came to the conclusion that what the Ottoman Empire did was shameful, that it was disgraceful, and that it was manifestly sinful. And exactly what the Ottoman Empire did 600 years ago, after 600 years, Turkey has again repeated the same shameful, disgraceful, and manifestly sinful act of taking the cathedral, a Christian cathedral, and transforming it into a masjid once more. In the interim, what uh, Mustafa Kemal had done was to take the house of God <laughs> and make it a museum. If you are comfortable with that, fine, that's your choice. But to take the house of God and make it a museum is an act of profound dis disrespect. <laughs> yes, to, to take a cathedral and make it a museum or take a masjid and make it a museum, that is disgraceful, really. Anyhow. Now then, I do not intend to take this session to deal with Hagia Sophia. Rather, because there are so many around the world of Islam today who are applauding, 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 yes. <laughs> so I'll write a book, Hagia Sophia and the Quran. And then I'll invite you to respond to my book, if you have any credibility, that is, 
if you have any scholarship, that is, because knowledge and guidance comes from the Book of Allah. Absolute truth is located in the Book of Allah, not in some bogus deed of sale. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the, the Christians sold the cathedral to the Ottomans and they have a, they have a, a deed of sale. Yes. Well, at least we have some, some fun this morning to make us laugh. Anyhow. What, what, what I want to do, excuse me, it's so funny. If, if you betray the Quran, if on this issue, for example, of Hagia Sophia, you do not go to the Quran for your primary guidance and you go elsewhere, if you betray the Quran, what is the price you'll have to pay? That's all I want to do today. And on another occasion, we'll analyze the subject. And I want to write the book, Hagia Sophia and the Quran, inshallah. May Allah give me life to do that. I want to take you to Judgment Day. And those who are to be blessed to enter into heaven have gone into heaven. And the rest have gone into the hellfire. And then our prophet said, this is what our prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. He said that he will come before Allah and he would bend down in prostration with his head on the, with his forehead on the ground. I remember... I visited the Pluscarton Abbey. They call it Abbey in Scotland. They don't call it um, monastery. In, in, in Scotland, close to Inverness. And uh, the, the deputy of the Abbey, Abbey um, he, uh, Father Guys, he took me around the Abbey for a tour. <laughs> this is the Roman Catholic Abbey in... Um, uh, in the northern Scotland. And as he went around, <laughs> taking me on a tour of the abbey, he came to a small chapel which could seat only about 30 people, a tiny chapel. And I noticed that the seats were folding, folding seats, you could pull it up. So I asked, why uh, do you have the folding seats? He says, because there's a small space, because we have to go down and prostrate. So we had to pull the seats up. I said, could you show me how you prostrate? And the uh, father guys then went down and made sijda, the way we pray. We pray with our hands on the earth and with our forehead on the earth. We're in a kneeling position. And that's exactly how he, he went down exactly the way we prayed, the same way the Roman Catholic uh, monk went down and prayed. So on that day, Judgment Day, our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, will come in that position before Allah with his forehead on the earth, on the ground. Not the earth, the ground. And then uh, he will praise Allah with words that Allah will put in his heart. MashaAllah, that Allah could put things in our heart to praise Him. MashaAllah. And then Allah will say to him, Rise, Muhammad, ask what you want. And uh, MashaAllah, to be told that Allah will say to us, Ask what you want. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You can ask to Allah, please, my father and my mother, Please take them into heaven. Eh? These are the closest of all to you, your father and your mother. Kindly, Allah, kindly take them into heaven. So Allah will say, rise, Muhammad, ask what you want. And Allah will then allow him to go into the hellfire. This is the hadith. Take out of the, hell, out of the hellfire whosoever he wants to take out. This is shafar, intercession. 
So he goes into the hellfire and he takes out from the hellfire those from within his ummah, people who follow him. There are those who follow Jesus, there are those who follow Moses, there are those who follow that one, and we are those who follow Muhammad. We don't follow Jesus, we follow Muhammad. So Allah will say, go and take out, go and take out who you want. So he takes out from the hellfire those who meet you, and they then enter into heaven. Allah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, they enter into heaven because of the intercession of Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon him. So be careful. Don't abandon the sunnah because the government tells you, stand three feet apart, prayers. And you abandon the sunnah for that? <laughs> no, 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 you don't do that. No, no, you schoolboy, <laughs> excuse me. If you cannot perform the salat in accordance with the sunnah, you suspend the salat rather than betray the Prophet, hmm? So those who follow him, he will take them out of, out of the hellfire. But those who follow the government instead of following him, you remain there. He won't take you out because you betrayed him. And then he will again stand, sit prostrate before Allah. And again he'll praise Allah and Allah will say to him, rise and ask. And he goes, he's given permission to go a second time and then a third time to take out of the hellfire all those he wants to take out, who have some faith in their heart. When he has taken out all that he could take out on the third occasion, then he says, only those now remain in the hellfire who I would like to take out, but I cannot take out. Why? Because the Quran prohibits me. If you betray the Quran, then even Nabi Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, even he cannot take you out of the hellfire. This is your brother Imran, speaking gently, speaking softly, speaking lovingly. To all those over there who are supporting the Turkish government in what they have done in taking a Christian cathedral, and transforming it into a masjid one more time. All of you, I'm speaking gently, I'm speaking respectfully, I'm speaking lovingly. I'm saying to you, and I'm warning you, do not betray the Quran. If you want to go to the Quran and you don't know how to go, then I will help you. Read this book. Read this book, study this book, critically examine this book. If I'm wrong, then come and correct me. Yes, come and correct me if I'm wrong. And then make up your mind. Don't do this without first studying the Quran on the subject of Hagia Sophia. This is my warning to you. If you betray the Quran, then on judgment day, even Muhammad Islam, even he cannot take you out of the hellfire. Now then, I will, uh, I will deal with the subject of Hagia Sophia on another occasion. I hope I have enough time. Uh, I have to travel. I'm just waiting for permission to travel. Um, and then I'll travel. But in the meantime, uh, I want to uh, deal with the subject of Hagia Sophia before I leave Trinidad. And I also want to write a book. I just have to thank Allah. Yes, thank you, Allah, that I'm still alive. And Hagia Sophia has now reached center stage in the world. Yes. <laughs> One more comment. One more comment for those of you who are supporting what the Turkish government has done. I just want to tickle your intellect to, to whet your appetite for knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, if you travel, someone sent me 
uh, a sister sent me an email, uh, maybe from from Abu Dhabi or Bahrain or Oman somewhere. An Arab sister sent me an email and said to me, "Look, see a straight line. If you draw a straight line from Constantinople to Medina, guess where the straight line will pass through? Answer: The straight line from Constantinople." to Medina will pass through Jerusalem. And I want to remind you, and uh, I don't want to take up all the time today on this subject because I want to complete Gog and Magog and Zulkar name. Um, if you consider that very, very important prophecy of Nabi Muhammad concerning events that will unfold in Akhir Zaman, in the end time, uh, he mentioned three cities, three, in that famous hadith of Abu Dawood, in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. Three cities. He mentions Constantinople. He mentions Jerusalem, Baitul Maqdis. And he mentions Yatrib, which is Medina. These three cities. And take a, a straight line and you'll know... <laughs> from Constantinople to Medina, and you see it pass through Jerusalem. Is that a coincidence? What does he say in that hadith? He speaks of two cities out of the three, which will grow in prominence, taking center stage. And the third one in forlorn desolation, playing no role at all. You know the hadith. I have quoted it one million times and uh, now my students are tired of hearing me about it and yet there are those who even if I quote it one million times they don't want to listen to it I don't know why it's uncomfortable for them to listen to it yes they would prefer not to listen to it is that your respect for truth is that integrity that when you hear something that's uncomfortable but it's the truth, you ignore it. Hmm? He said, Allah's Messenger said, I'm going to quote the Arabic, and I'll, I'll translate. He said about six events or five events that will occur in the end time. And he's speaking to his companion, um, Mu'az ibn Jabal. And they are sitting close to each other. And he says to him, Umran Ubaytil Maqdis, Kharabu Yatrib. That at that time, he's using the analogy of construction. This, this is analogical reasoning. The analogy of construction. That when Jerusalem, Baytul Maqdis is Jerusalem. He says, when Jerusalem is built up, meaning center stage in the world, then Look to Medina, Yatrib. It will be in forlorn desolation. Hmm? Um, three years ago, the United States of America took Jerusalem and brought it center stage. That's right, three years ago. And uh, it has remained there when uh, the government of the United States of America recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Hmm? So Jerusalem is now center stage. Uh, I don't think I don't think Jerusalem was, was center stage six hundred years ago, was it? Will you not think? Will you not think? Jerusalem is now center stage. The United States has now recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and the United States is the ruling state in the world. It still is. Pax Americana has not as yet ended. Umran Ubaytil Makdis Kharabu Yatrib. But when Jerusalem is center stage in the world, Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is prophesying, as only a prophet can prophesy, that at that time Medina will be in forlorn desolation, meaning the Ummah of Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, has no role to play on the stage of the world. Forlorn desolation. Medina 
symbolizes the Ummah or the Muslim world. Jerusalem symbolizes the state of Israel and the Zionist alliance. Hmm? So they will be center stage and we will be in full-on desolation, having no role to play, except as client states of NATO. <laughs> That's right. Then he said, Kharabu Yatrib Khurujul Malhama. At that time when Yatrib is in full on desolation, meaning the Ummah of Muhammad is playing no role at all on the stage of the world, it is at that time that the Malhama will occur. Are you going to tell me the Malhama took place 600 years ago? Will you not think? When will you think? That's all I'm asking you to do, to think. I don't want you to be in the Jahannam, into the hellfire. And then in the hellfire, guess what you say? It's there in Surah Al-Mulk. لَوْ كُنَّ نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعَكِرُ مَا كُنَّ فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّيْءِ If we used to listen, and if we used to think, we wouldn't be in the hellfire today. I don't want you to say that on, the, on that day. I want you to think now. Hmm? This is where we are today. The Malhama has not as yet taken place. It didn't take place 600 years ago. This is where we are today. The Malhama is about to take place. Armageddon is about to take place. All the strategic thinkers in Russia are now coming to this conclusion that we cannot avoid it. This great war is coming. The Chinese are preparing for it. They know it's coming. Yes. And you're going to tell me it took place 600 years ago? Hmm? No. The great war has not as yet taken place. The great war is the Malhama. And what the Christians and Jews call Armageddon, it has not as yet taken place. Will you please wake up from your sleep? Then he went on to say, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. That it is after. Do you know, understand the meaning of the word after? Huh? It is after the Malhama that Constantinople will be conquered. So why do you waste my time? Even if you are scholars, why do you waste my time by telling me that the prophecy of the conquest of Constantinople took place 600 years ago? Can't you think? What's wrong with your capacity to think? No. The conquest of Constantinople <laughs> comes this is the conquest prophesied by Prophet Muhammad It will come after the Malhama. And the Malhama has not as yet taken place. So I am not concerned at this time with anything that came before the Malhama. That's irrelevant. Irrelevant. Nothing. It should not be brought into our conversation. Take it away, please. We are concerned about events of Akhir Zaman. We're concerned about a conquest of Constantinople which will come after the Malhama. After the Malhama. So now in this hadith, we know three cities are mentioned. The first one mentioned is Jerusalem. The second one mentioned is Medina. And now the third one mentioned is Constantinople. And there's a straight line running from one to the second to the third. And then after the conquest of, he said, Fathul Constantinia Khurujud Dajjal. That after the conquest of Constantinople, then, then Dajjal will appear in human form. Yes, in human, Dajjal is not a system. No, Dajjal has to appear as a human being, a young man, a Jew, powerfully built with the curls at his side. Hmm? Yes. Now then, our prophet said that between the Malhama or the conquest, uh, the, the, the great war, Armageddon, 
and the conquest of Constantinople. Between these two, there's a period of a short period. One hadith mentions seven months, the other one mentions seven years, and Abu Dawood says, I believe it's seven years. So seven years is a short period of time. And in a short period of time after that conquest, after that great war, Constantinople will be conquered. When will you wake up? If your scholars, if your mufti refuse to think, if your branded scholars refuse to think, why should you refuse to think? Let them, let them be as they are. Because our prophet prophesied, he says uh, about Akhir Zaman, he said, Ulama'uhum sharrun nasi mimman tahtadimis sama. Min aindihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'ud. That in the end time, he said, the scholars of Islam will be the worst people beneath the sky, corrupting the people, telling the people, you can pray with a face mask in the masjid. Me? If I have to go into the supermarket and they say you have to wear a face mask to enter, I will put it on at the entrance and take it out at the entrance when I come out. Throw it away. Or put it in my pocket. Just to go in the supermarket, but not in the masjid. The masjid cannot impose that upon me. The supermarket can impose it. But the house of Allah cannot impose that upon me. The house of Allah is sovereign. Allah is sovereign in his masjid, not the government. Allah is sovereign in his house, not the government. So the government cannot, cannot impose on me and force upon me in the house of Allah that which Allah does not order me. So I will not wear a face mask in the masjid. No, if there is virus and it's dangerous, then stay home. Don't go in the masjid. Suspend the salat. Don't corrupt the salat. That's right. And so, the conquest of Constantinople, which will come between about, about seven years after the Malhama, that conquest of Constantinople will be followed by the Khuruj of Dajjal. Dajjal will now appear in human form, right? And uh, we will be able to recognize it and see him. Dajjal has not appeared as yet in human form. I have written two books on Dajjal, two books uh, over there. Um, you can could, you could start studying. I don't know how many scholars of Islam are teaching the subject of Dajjal, but I am teaching it. And I've been teaching the subject of Gog and Magog. And so, why, why is there a prophesied conquest of Constantinople in Akhir Zaman? Will you ask that question? Or are you afraid? <laughs> are you afraid to ask that question? Or are you of those people, I call them the sheep and the cattle, who believe that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by the Prophet occurred 600 years ago. And if you peddle that falsehood, then in Jahannam you, you will say, Law kunna nasma wa na'akilu ma kunna fi ashabi say, because you're uttering a falsehood against Nabi Muhammad Yes. You don't have sense to think capacity to think before you open your mouth. Why, why is there a prophesied conquest of Constantinople in Akhir Zaman? I have offered my answer. And my answer is located in the verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah in which Allah speaks about a Christian people becoming closest in love and affection for Muslims. And I say that this is linked with the Orthodox Christian world, not with that Christian world which follows Santa Claus, the West, the Western Christian. I'm talking about this, this, this Orthodox Christian world. And Hagia Sophia is located at the heart of this Christian world. And if you take Hagia Sophia and transform it into a masjid, you're driving a dagger 
dagger into the heart of this Christian world. That Christian world is hypocritical, but this Christian world is not. So if you take Hagia Sophia and you transform it one more time into a masjid, you are driving a dagger into the heart of this Christian world. That's what you're doing. And if you're declaring that there was a genocide in Srebrenica, genocide, genocide, yes, from Islamabad, genocide, geno that's right. You beat the drums, beat the drums, <laughs> so the money can come from the IMF. Hmm? You, if you say there was genocide in Sre Srebrenica, hmm? You know what's the implication of the word genocide? Do you know it? Yes, there was genocide in Armenia. I know it, but not genocide in Srebrenica. Why? Because the whole Turkish nation supported what was done to the Armenians. That's why it was genocide. And up to this day, they defend what the Ottoman Empire, not the... Not the religious em Ottoman Empire. I'm talking about the secular Ottoman Empire. After, the, after 1918, it was a secular government. It was a secular government in, Eastern, in um, Constantinople which committed the genocide. In fact, the genocide continued for about 30 years and continued until 1924. From the late, from 1918, uh, 90-something, until 1924, for 30 years, there was genocide of the Armenian Christians. Yes. Uh, supported by the Turkish people. Yes, that is genocide. But did the Serbian people support the massacre of the Muslims of Srebrenica? Will you not ask them? And before you insist, no, 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 Imran Hussein is wrong, Imran Hussein is wrong. He, he doesn't want to use the word genocide because the American government told me it's genocide and the British government told me it's genocide, so it has to be genocide. The Americans and the British NATO don't tell lies. <laughs> ah, yes. On Judgment Day, you will see the role that NATO played in the massacre of the Muslims. And you're blaming the Serbian people for that? I have been to Belgrade twice and the Serbian people condemn what happened to the Muslims. How can you call it genocide? Don't you have any sense? Can't you understand the meaning of the word genocide before you open your mouth in Islamabad? Hmm? The, the uh, transformation of Hagia Sophia into a masjid one more time drives a dagger into the heart of the Orthodox Christian people. Oh, Washington is applauding. They're very happy. Even though they issue hypocritical statements, but they're very happy. Because they want to see between the world of Islam and the Orthodox Christian world, they want to see hatred. And if you continue with that hatred for the Orthodox Christian world, if you support what the Turkish government has done to this masjid, wait. Wait for when the war comes and India attacks Pakistan. <laughs> Wait for that day when India attacks Pakistan. And then you have to fight India by yourself all alone. Nobody to help you. Nobody to help you. Because when you turn to China for help, let me use my words carefully before anybody misinterpret me. Of course China will want to help Pakistan. But China knows that when India attacks Pakistan, India will be attacking with the full support of NATO and Israel. This is the most powerful military machine in the world for so long now. Will, Ch will China be willing to take on all of them on behalf of Pakistan? No, the Chinese are very careful in their thinking. They're not rash. And uh, I have said it once before, but the Hindu India did not understand me or willfully misrepresented me. What I'm saying is that on that day when India attacks Pakistan, and that attack is coming, it is coming, it is coming, because this Hindu government in India wants war. On that day when India attacks Pakistan, India will have the support of NATO and Israel. And the only way 
that China can intervene in such a war, military, is if China is supported by Russia. Of course China will want to intervene. Of course China will want to support Pakistan. But China is not a fool. China knows that they cannot take them on alone. China knows that the only way that she can take on NATO is if Russia is with her. Why, 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 oh Pakistani people, why should Russia do such a thing? When you just slapped Russia on the face, yes, by supporting what this foolish Turkish government has done to take their cathedral, the Russian Orthodox Christians, they have the greatest love for this cathedral. All the Orthodox Christian world have the greatest love for this cathedral. And you slap them on their face and you transform it into a masjid disgracefully and shamefully and sinfully. And now you're going to beg them for help when our India is attacking you? Don't you have any sense in your head? Why should Russia, Russia help you? No. I don't think Russia will help you on that day. Because the Russians love their religion. The Russian people love their monastery. They love their church. The Russian people love Hagia Sophia. They'll never, 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 never forget Hagia Sophia. And so today, you put a nail in your coffin when you're supporting Turkey in what they have done to Hagia Sophia, because Russia will not intervene to help you on that day. You better go to Washington and ask Washington for help when India attacks you. Yes, what a foolish people who have lost the capacity 